Hello, and welcome to another episode of Prime Time, a video where I sit down, prime some canvases, and answer y'all's questions. So let's just jump right into it. Okay, hopefully, maybe you can use the first one. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> on this episode of Prime Time, I reached out to you guys on Instagram, and y'all asked some questions, and there's some really good ones. And so I'm going to go through those as I prime some wood canvases. I have several big ones, and so hopefully I can work through these. But it's great because you can sit. It's kind of a mindless task. Usually if I don't have questions to get to, I do this on um, while listening to audiobooks. <laughs> Not sponsored by Audible, but yeah. <laughs> so I'm just going to jump right into it. So my first question is number one tip for being an artist on Instagram. So that's that's a broad question but the first thing that comes to mind is a pretty broad answer which is to develop really good boundaries okay whenever i see boundaries I, people get a little hyper and i always forget that not everyone consumes self-help books like it's water <laughs> speaking of beverages this is a little kombucha I'm living up to like my austin hippie stereotype but it's good stuff Anyways, okay, boundaries are basically limits that you put, understanding that you can't control, you know, the person you're interacting with. In this case, it's the internet. It's a whole bunch of persons <laughs> you're trying to put limits on, right? The internet is, can really take you for a ride. It can really stress you out. It can mess with your mental health, as well as be a vehicle for opportunity, right? It's, it's good and bad. It's both, and I, personally think it's equal parts, good and bad, right? So in order to reap the benefits of social media, which are reach, exposure, community building, a place to hold you accountable and to show your work, in order to get those things, you have to, to some extent, learn how to work with the less pleasant parts of the internet. There's a lot of nuance to the internet. So when coming up with boundaries, you have to say, it's less about you telling the internet to do something or not to do something. You can't just tell the internet, be nice to me, treat me with humanity. Like you just, that's not how this, the world works. <laughs> so it's an if then statement. It's a, it's a way for you to put a limit. Boundaries for me include who I do and do not take feedback from, right? I can't just allow any, what is the saying? Like Tom, Dick, and Sally, <laughs> such an old person saying. You can't just let any person tell you something and have it shake you to your core. Like you can't get mad if Shrek 52, let's be honest, Shrek 69 <laughs> comes along and, you know, says something about your artwork. You can't just take that to heart. You don't know who they are. Are they making art? Like, I'm not saying like people don't have value, but if you don't have any skin in the game, then like I have made a boundary that I don't care what you have to say. And that's for my mental health. So, you know, for me, over the years, boundaries have changed. In the beginning, I really didn't have too many because I had a very small community and the stakes were pretty low and, you know, I didn't need a lot. But as my kids have gotten older, as I've had to be a little bit more discerning with how I spend my time, you know, as I've just kind of learned that I need to be treated better, <laughs> I've gotten better boundaries. And so what do those look like, right? Okay, so for me, it's, you know, I do not share quite a bit of personal information on the internet. And it's nothing, you know, crazy. Like I, I actually have a very, very underwhelming, boring life to most people. I love it, I think it's great. But the highlight of my day is usually like cooking dinner and going on a walk, it's very boring. But I keep my children pretty off limits. I keep my um, relationship with my partner very off limits of the internet. I don't want to be an influencer. That Now, that boundary, that saying I will not do that has cut me off from opportunity, but it's a limit that I've set to protect my mental health. And, you know, and I, I also will say that like, there's quite a bit of privilege to being able to set certain boundaries. Like I am envious of people who can set a boundary that they only work five or six or seven hours a day. <laughs> I, I can't I can't afford to do that yet, but one day I will, hopefully. And that'll be great. So it's it's different for everyone. And you know, another boundary that I've set recently is I don't have Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest on my phone anymore. 
I have, or Facebook, I, I pretty much just have texting and YouTube on my phone. And if I, if YouTube gets any traction, I will take that off my phone and just have audiobooks. So, and, 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 hold on. and in addition to that, I also don't get on my phone and do much after about five o'clock at night. I pretty much clock out. I also have boundaries of how many comments and messages I get back to. I wish I could multiply myself and make like 10 of us and we'd sit around for an hour a day and get to all of them. But I have to find a way to put a limit on that. So I usually give myself about two hours a day, maybe one hour on the weekends. And I get back to emails first, texts next, or maybe flip those. And then whatever is left, direct messages, and then comments. And that means that some seasons of life and, you know, when I have more traction. Okay, first one done. I don't always get back to all my comments. And... I know that that's potentially missed opportunity, but it's a boundary that I've set up to protect my mental health. My number one tip for being an artist on Instagram, figure out boundaries, set them, be willing to reevaluate them and be protective of your mental health. I think Instagram is great. I don't think I would be here if it was not for social media. I, would, don't, I don't think I'd be an artist. So at least not in the capacity I am now. And so I'm grateful for social media, but it is hell on your mental health. So yeah, setting boundaries. If, if you still don't know what I mean by boundaries and you feel very stressed by the mental, emotional demands of social media, I would suggest reading some books on boundaries. I think of the one I read with my mom actually a long, long time ago, like in high school, was Henry Cloud's boundary books. It was like, I think it's where you begin and I start or something like that. I will link a couple of my favorites. Anything by Brene Brown is fantastic. And uh, Bell Hooks talks a lot about love and boundaries and it's all good keep keep that stuff in mind remember that the internet has the ability to be very good and very bad and you want to just protect yourself and that way you can curate your experience a little bit better so that's my big suggestion the next question do i have a team or am i a one woman show as they write love that i am more of a mom and pop shop so i it's mostly my husband and i who do almost everything and we also have my sister who has recently in the last year moved down to my little town right outside of Austin. And her husband is a jack of all trades, <laughs> the kind of guy who can like build an engine from scratch and build 3D printers and edit your videos and, you know, do everything. And so I, my husband and I do almost everything. My sister helped me a little bit with running, not sorry, art school. That's usually a couple hours a week of, of work. And then as needed, her husband will come over, help a little bit with prints. He edits my YouTube and that's kind of it. We really have needed to look into contracting and hiring out gig workers, but we've been really slow to do that. I don't have a good reason other than <laughs> we're okay with growing slow to some extent. I, I get, going back to the boundary conversation, this does mean potentially missed opportunity. So one thing I think a lot about in terms of business growth is you want to be careful not to grow too fast. And let me just rephrase this. I, this is how I'm thinking. I am not giving business advice. <laughs> I'm not, I don't think I'm in a place where I can do that. So I'll just tell you kind of insight into my mind. I did, I never liked the idea of growing too quickly because people get hurt you say and do things, you know, you kind of shoot from the hip when you grow too fast. I think of, for example, Vibram. Yes, a shoe company. Weird. I, my husband and I both at various points worked in running shoe stores in our early to mid 20s, trying to make money as creatives. We both ran in college, cross country. So we were runners and we saw this trend. If, you, if you're a runner, you'll know, or if you've been into shoes in the 2000s, early 2000s, big bulky ASIC shoes with a big thick wedge of foam were everything. It was like the cutting edge of technology. That's how you prevented your legs from getting injured from overuse injuries and everything was big foam. So all the shoes had these big wedges in the back. Then this little company came out of seemingly nowhere. I'm sure it wasn't out of nowhere. And they really touted the idea that actually barefoot running is the best way you won't run as hard, it's more ergonomic, it's better form, et cetera, et cetera. And they exploded. They sort of did this appeal to nature fallacy, if you want to call it, which is just to say that everything 
natural is inherently superior, which we know that that's not entirely true. But it was a callback to going the other direction. And they exploded. They sort of said yes to everything. They hopped on the bandwagon of these books that were being written about these um, indigenous tribes in Central America running, which I will say separately, amazing, wonderful. I think the problem is always when <laughs> people try to commercialize and capitalize off of that and on in a kind of problematic way. I, I you know, I, again, I'm not giving it business advice, but just from a spectator, you know, I think it grew really fast. And this happens with companies all the time. The, this is just the one I always, that comes to mind. And for me, there's this sense of urgency about running a business and I'm always trying to push against that. Now, granted, there there are, you know, seductive narratives with urgency that you're gonna miss out and you gotta strike while the iron's hot. And I, while there's some truth to that, I think mostly that the way of thinking really limits how you're able to look at your company. And so I've always preferred to grow slow and to grow more sustainably and in a way that doesn't feel rushed because I would like to not overpromise, not hurt people. I don't think I had the capabilities to run a business even when my business was exploding. Like I had a ton of growth in like 20, into 2018, 2019, and there were a ton of opportunities. And those have slowed down a little bit. You know, they've been replaced by, in my opinion, better opportunities, a little less merch and, you know, books and a little more shows. And, and so for me, it's like, it's a good thing. But, you know, if you are a bottom line person and your sole goal is growth, then you may look at how I've, oops, you may look at how I've run a business and think that I've missed and that's okay. So all that to say, it really mostly is my husband and I, and I get a little bit of help from my sister and her husband, and it feels really good to be able to help them out and they help us out and it feels very mutual and it's non-exploitative <laughs> and I feel better. I sleep better at night knowing that I'm doing it that way and maybe, maybe I'm missing out than growing really fast, trying to create a team and, you know, having it grow in that way before I was ready and then potentially make errors that really hurt people. So that's probably deeper than what you wanted to know, but that's sort of the way I'm thinking. I'd love to scale. I think I'm slowly getting to a point where <laughs> I've got enough experience, I'm a little bit wiser, and, and growth may not be the worst thing in the world, but I wasn't always at that place. And so it's been a slow, slow growth thing. If I have to answer my one woman show or team, I'm a mom and pop shop and my sister and her husband help a little bit on the side. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's a good operation. I love where it's at. And honestly, if I stay like this forever, would be fine with that too. Another question kind of pertaining to that, it's how long did it take you to succeed as an artist? Great question. And I, I guess the short answer is like kind of a long time. I went to school for art. I went to college for art. I was really lucky to get to go to college. I have a whole other video kind of about that. If you want to have that in detail, maybe I'll have it drop down here. But I went to college on a running scholarship or else it would not have been possible. So, it, you know, depending on how you want to look at it, those four years of school, that was an investment. That was me working towards an art career without any yield. I think I sold a couple of little graphic designs. And then also, you know, working a fast food, food service industry type job gave me a lot of experience in how to work with customers and the public. And, you know, it gave me some commerce type skills. I eventually was like a manager <laughs> at the ice cream place I worked at. And so that was, building towards my art career. So if we're looking timeline, you can sort of maybe count those four years. And then I graduated and had a huge quarter life crisis, like a complete light break from reality type thing, like really scary. Anyways, got to some therapy. So again, if you wanna count that therapy and that like life reset as working towards my art, I would, I certainly would. It's not conventional. <laughs> I don't think I would put it on a wall with like my certificates. Then about a year and a half out of college, I had just had a baby, a wonderful surprise baby, but a baby nonetheless. That baby was two months old and I told myself, I need to figure out what I'm doing with my life <laughs> a little bit. And so I started a one painting a day Instagram account. That was January 1st of 2016. And 
that was just to see if I even liked art. I was so out of touch of what my needs were. I was so frazzled. So I started doing that and I wasn't making a penny. I just did it during my son's nap time. And about a year in, I was able to get some real deal, small gig work. I guess small is relative. Small compared to what I do now, but it would be pretty, uh, it felt huge at the time. One of them was a community health center. I was able to do 10 paintings. It was, it's funny cause it was actually a proposal. My husband's dad proposed to me when I was in college and I just student athlete, I worked a fast food job and was going to school, just did not have the time. And I said, I'll take a rain check. And I assumed he would just hire someone else or, you know, fill the job. Well, I think his parents may have been concerned for me because they re-offered it to me and I, I took it. So I was able to get a thousand dollars per painting. And at the time that was about a third of what we were making annually. <laughs> So it was, uh, needless to say, was a huge deal. You know, we still had to pay for shipping and supplies and all that stuff. So it broke down to be a little bit less, but it was still like humongous for us. And so that sustained me after that first year into the next year where I was able to go from, okay, this is a one year experiment to maybe I can try to do this a little more. Definitely wasn't making any regular income. And then towards the end of that second year, I was able to get a mural project with an architect in Austin and very sparse. I don't even think it was enough to qualify for part-time work <laughs> in between there. But at the end of 2017, I got in with a local emerging art gallery and then I got that mural. And then I would say at that point, I became a part-time business. Then it was a part-time business. And then I would say that it was about 2018 when my account took off. So everything prior to this was less than 2000 people following me, you know, not amazing engagement, just a little thing. I was posting daily, but it was small. And then the traction, sorry, that was on, the traction on Instagram made it possible to start to sell directly to my audience, which hadn't really, I hadn't been able to do that. Now I was selling my paintings for pretty cheap at this time, but they were selling regularly. So it was a pretty good deal. I made a painting every day and, and like 70% of the time they sold. From 2018 to 2019, I would say it went from kind of a low income, somewhere between part-time job and I, and maybe a, 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 a modest full-time job. So definitely couldn't have supported myself entirely on my own. My husband had a job as a sports writer, it was a creative job, and it was so much better than what I grew up with as a child. It felt very lavish, but definitely wasn't long-term sustainable, definitely wasn't enough money to completely live on or save on. It was just a very meager, young professional income. So then in 2020, I was able to start to really invest in some passive streams of income, things I had been thinking about in 2019, but was finally able to implement in 2020. And from that and some projects finally paying off and some licensing and various other parts of income, I was able to turn being an artist into full-time work. So namely prints, licensing, teaching, things like that I was able to pull together and have enough income that it went from a full-time job to like now I can employ my husband. Although that always makes it sound kind of unfair because because he's able to help me so much with like the back end stuff. So like taxes and organizing the print orders and watching our children. You know, we co-watch the children pretty evenly. Between all of that, we are able to make it as an income. I don't know. So however you want to look at success, Along there, I would look back along all of that and tell myself that at every point, I feel like I was being successful because in that first year, I think just showing up and doing something besides surviving, <laughs> keeping my kid alive and, and happy and healthy, like anything outside of that, I was incredibly proud of myself. And you know, that first, maybe the second and third year, the fact that I was able to stretch our budget, do gig work, keep our kid happy, healthy, and do part-time work, I would consider that a success. And then my ability to turn that part-time success into full-time success, I would consider that a success. So it's it's all relative. Take with that what you will. I, I have a feeling that if I did not have children, that could have been condensed into a couple years. But you know, 
having kids is that's a trade-off. So that's kind of where my journey has taken me. It still doesn't feel incredibly secure all the time, but I, um, yeah, I'm just showing up. I'm doing it. I'm continuing to try to find different ways to diversify my income, to grow my talents, to invest in myself and my community. And yeah, I'm here now. Another question. Advice on creating interesting content for your paintings. Yes. So isn't that the dilemma these days? <laughs> Not only must you make an original piece of artwork, but on top of that, you now have to create an interesting piece of video content, at least dynamic photos. And our job as creators has just gotten incredibly hard. And the tough thing about it is a lot of times it's harder for less reach, which is why I've been trying to move and diversify my income. I have been listening to the Instagram talks, the updates that they do, they do them on live sometimes. And they have been telling us for years now, probably three years solidly, that they are going to not only limit growth and who you can reach, but they are going to switch to video. So I have been trying for years to try to get myself some video skill under my belt. I didn't go to school for video stuff, but I just use InShot, which is a very friendly app. C could I probably do better with like Premiere or Find? Yes, but it's not accessible. And between watching children <laughs> and running a household, and actually painting and then making content and then getting back to people. I needed something quick and easy. And so InShot had really good reviews. That was years ago. I'm just familiar with it now. Whatever app you like to use, good photo editing app on your phone. And I have just trained myself to record with my left hand. So my tip, anchor it to your body <laughs> and sort of learn how to try to document as much on here. And also, if you can get a second camera, if you can have an iPad, for a long time, I just borrowed my husband's iPhone up until like, I think less than a year ago, actually. And I would just record while I was doing that. And just save up photo content. You don't have to have the whole thing planned out while you're painting it. And it doesn't have to be the whole thing from beginning to end. Oh, hold on. And it doesn't have to be the whole thing from beginning to end. I can't tell you the amount of times I've been recording something in the middle, like the best part cuts out. You can always, make a small clip of like the beginning, a little piece of the middle, the clip you forgot, just go over it. And then somehow unveiling the finished piece, that is totally fine. The other thing is you can always just find an interesting way to show the finished product, right? There's so many different prompts online, you know, especially if you're younger, like your cultural capital, the fact that you are so tapped into what's cool and what's fun, that is, you can directly monetize that bad boy. That's what I did. I think the fact that I started out on Instagram relatively young and sort of had like a pretty good lay of the landscape meant that I could use that to my advantage. And the older I get, the more like I have to put more energy in that. I, a lot of my day, a lot of my day is spent watching children and doing kind of the boring business part of things. And I have less time to just scroll and take in the world around me. And the trade-off for that is I have to work harder to come up with better content because I have less of a pool of understanding of what the social landscape is. And that's totally fine. That happens. It's a trade-off. And so if you are younger, like lean into the trends, like that is such a good way. I mean, you can't sustain yourself with trends alone, but how are other people showing their finished products? Like how are musicians showing their songs? Think outside the box, have fun with it. I feel like one thing about audiences is they are so good at sensing if something's inauthentic or you're begrudgingly doing something. I found that even if it means my quality is less, <laughs> even if it means I look cringier or campier or whatever, if I'm having fun with something, that always does better, performs better, and I just sleep better at night making that kind of content. So, you know, just give yourself a break. <laughs> know that it might be cringy in the beginning. And, and give your, and just be kind to yourself. It's hard to learn how to video everything, but it is a worthy thing to invest in. I think it's as valuable as putting skill in as an artist. That's very valuable too, but learn to balance both. Okay, so my last little takeaway for that is just to make sure you're having fun, stay plugged into what people are doing. I don't mean like be consumed with it and don't just do what other people are doing, but you know, as you consume content and as you hang out, just the things that excite you most about other people's content, whether that's the way they reveal it, the way they use music, just keep attention to what makes you happy and excited and 
find a way to creatively and authentically incorporate it. And if you need to give credit, of course, do that. But yeah, just have fun with it. And another question to kind of build off of that is how do I go about making my content? Do you bulk and schedule? How far ahead do you plan? I would say generally I don't do a ton of planning. I always say that and then when I explain to people how I do it, I'm like, I guess there is kind of a plan. I would probably benefit from structure and plan. <laughs> if I'm being honest, but I loosely have a weekly schedule. So everything I do, I, I pretty much live the same day on repeat. It's like Groundhog Day, just because of having a kid and having a kid, just between having kids and, you know, I just need to put out a lot of content. So I pretty much have the same work schedule every day. But that being said, I, I have like a weekly schedule that I loosely follow. Um, and I sort of build it around that. I will say, like, I, I'm not gonna give a ton of detail about my content schedule, not because I'm anything's proprietary, like just go look through my TikTok and Instagram, but because I'm actually trying to change it. <laughs> Back to like the very beginning of the video, I'm trying to come up with more boundaries just because social media, there's starting to be a point where the return is so low on what I do <laughs> that it's, beginning to eat away at my soul. And just like I said earlier, when you find your mental health starting to suffer, it's time to reevaluate your boundaries, right? That being said, let me explain like what I certainly do do. I always take Friday off of Instagram for the most part, I guess I shouldn't say always. Occasionally I'll have like enough content where posting something else on Friday makes sense, but generally I take Friday off. Fridays are the worst performing days for me unless I do something at like 6 a.m. and I just, don't want to do that. <laughs> on Wednesday, I always do for TikTok what's going on in my studio Wednesday, which is great. Having weekly planned out content can be very helpful. So at the beginning of the year, I did that for myself for TikTok schedule because I was having a hard time coming up with ideas. And then once I had enough ideas going, I sort of abandoned most things on that schedule except for what's going on in my studio Wednesday. That was really fun. It doesn't do great algorithm wise, but I really like it. Because when I do think of content, I guess like the thing I do plan the most is I always think of like 10% of my content needs to be about reach and it is number based. Like I do need to get past my core audience so that new people can find me because that's part of how you go our business. But everyone already knows about that. Everyone's already consumed with that. What I think is really important is creating content that people who already kind of like you and know you enjoy like catering to your your fans i always think of the saying like dance with the one who brung you <laughs> which is just like southern or ozark for if the people who are already invested in you don't abandon them for chasing new people like cater to them what do they want to see and so the fact that most of my content is it really is irrelevant whether it does well or not if it doesn't perform well the focus is really to make content that i would want to see if i was a super fan so like what's going on the studio Wednesday, which is where you get a tour. And so I focus on that. I also know that certain days of the week perform pretty well. So like Sundays do really well. Certain Wednesday mornings can do pretty well. I will occasionally check in with my analytics and see which days do well. And I will, if I, if I have a painting that I think is gonna perform pretty well, I will save it for one of those days. And I will avoid days that do really well. And, for, and I will avoid days and times that don't perform well. That's really personal. I would go check your analytics and figure that out by looking at those numbers. I will say if I'm about to go on a trip, which isn't super often between having kids and the panorama, I don't do a ton of travel. But if I do have a trip coming up or if I have a bunch of filming days for Not Sorry Art School, I will sometimes try to have a couple days where I work from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. with no breaks <laughs> and try to get myself a bunch of content. I don't love doing that, but sometimes that I will do a day like that to help myself kind of get caught up and have a little bit of batched content. But the thing with content creation and being an artist is it's almost like two separate things <laughs> and it is a ton of work. So give advice around that. <laughs> Again, it goes back to my initial point of really having those clear boundaries and how much you are willing to work without burning yourself out and what that looks like for you. So in short, I don't have a ton of structure and plan. A lot of people do and it works well for them. I kind of live the same day every day. So I always have an opportunity to make something new. 
and I make a ton of artwork. And so I haven't had to be super critical about a content schedule, but that will change going forward. <laughs> I mean, I'll make a video about it. If enough of you guys are interested, I'll, I can talk you through it. But I have already started working and hiring and doing some things to have a, a completely different shift to my content starting in January. So next January. So we go, I have a bit of a runway, but um, hopefully that'll be a whole different, whole different way of making content for me. It's not going to be that different for y'all, but it'll be different for me. So <laughs> anyways, but yeah, great question. So I got a couple of questions about the fluorescent paints I use. I just use the golden matte, the So Flat series, and I use a lot of their fluorescent greens and yellows and orange and pink. I think the fluorescent magenta is my favorite. And yeah, I, it works really well under black light. I haven't compared it to a lot of different brands. Supposedly it stays pretty fluorescent for a long time. I don't think it's like museum quality. So the color you get without the black light, like just expect that to be the color forever. <laughs> but yeah, fluorescent's really fun. I love incorporating them into my disco balls. But yeah, that's the, that's the brand I use. Okay, and then the final question is, is kind of superficial, but it's, are you not an artist if you use paint out of a tube? And it's so funny. I wanna do a whole video about painter misconceptions and where they came from. So the idea is that if you use a paint on a canvas straight out of a tube, that that somehow makes you less of an artist. I will say this and I will say this over and over and I don't mind saying it over and over because everyone needs to hear it. Rules in art, there are no rules in art. <laughs> that was so dramatic. <laughs> um, rules and stuff like that are really geared towards people trying to paint and paint realistically and really after a specific style, it's not just a broad rule. There's lots of rules like that and people think they're just like hard, fast rules. And I really blame the fact that so much of the art world is so like smoke and mirrors and secrets and let's not tell people how this is done. And you know, my practice is really precious and I never let anyone know what, what I'm doing or how I'm doing it. And I think that comes from a lot of insecurity in the art world. The more I'm in it, the more I meet people who are high up and curators and magazine people and artists that are established, the more I'm like, everyone is incredibly <laughs> insecure. Like that does not go away with success. That being said, I understand why newer painters are always like, well, what are the rules? There appears to be rules. Some people break the rules because they're like, their art isn't seen as legitimate. So like, what are the rules? And I don't think, I think it, I think a lot of times these ambiguous rules about professionalism and aesthetics and the do's and don't of visual art. I think they're, they're there to sort of justify weird biases that people have. And I'm not going to go deeper than that because I start to sound like I have a tinfoil hat on, but don't think too much into it. If you want to use every single tube color out of the tube on your paintings, great. That's fabulous. You should do that. If you are wanting to have a really masterful understanding of how to mix paints, then having your paint out just out of the tube may not be the best thing for you because you're going to want to learn how to mix your own paints. I would, if that's you specifically, I would say start with limited palette. Look into the Zorn palette, look into Google primary color oil paint palettes and see if you can find some palettes with just three, four, five colors. Learn how to mix with those. If you are not great at mixing color, that's going to be really hard, but that is going to be awesome work. Start with a warm up. Don't, don't make yourself do something you hate all the time, but try to incorporate that more and more. And the more comfortable you begin to feel with that limited palette, the better of an understanding you're going to have about color. Don't listen to rules. <laughs> rules are there. You pick them up, turn them over in your hand, ask yourself, does this fit me? Does this make sense for me? Who does this help? Ask yourself those questions, be critical. I'm so glad that I'm in a place now where I can be very critical of rules. And I'll catch myself being like, oh, you can't do that. And then I'll have to be like, wait, well, why can't you? And who said, and where does that rule come from? Art is meant to be subversive and break the rules. And so we should all be incredibly dubious of all of the rules and, you know, and be asking questions about it. So yeah, I get these questions a lot when I do lives and when I do these primetime videos. And I just want you guys to know that everything is on the board when it comes to art. As long as you're not exploiting someone, go forth, do crazy stuff. There is an artist who got his whole career started by shooting himself in the arm. <laughs> if that's a standard, if that's okay, if that's a path towards creative success, then by all means, use colors out of the tube if that makes you happy. Okay, that's it. That's all the questions that made sense in this video. 
Thank you so much for everyone who asked your questions. It always means a lot that anyone ever cares what I think. <laughs> I hope any of that was helpful. I'll try to remember to link some of the resources. If I'm slow to just remind me, just say, hey, link that thing and I will remember to do it then. I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Thanks for being on my YouTube channel. Always feel free to suggest video ideas. I, it does nothing but help me. So thank you and I'll see you next time.